welcome back to another episode. Super excited for this one. Today we have Brian Keating with us. So welcome to the show, man. Yeah, it's great to be with you. I like uh, like listening to your podcast and follow you online. It's, it's great to finally be there talking live. Yes, man. Thank you. Um, so yeah, to start us off, um, well, before I ask the first question, can you just tell us a little bit more about you and what you do? Yeah, so I am an uh, I'm a cosmologist, so I work on hair and nails, and it looks like <laughs> you could use a little help with Paul Tyler, my friend. <laughs> oh, he's already drilling me. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't. I can't help. No, it, I like it. Well, the nails. I think you're young and handsome, man. Yeah. Um, no, no worries. Um, so I'm a cosmologist. So I study the origin of the universe, the evolution of the universe. I apply um, experimental techniques to measure things like distant galaxies, stars, planets, even asteroids and meteoroids and things like that. Um, so from the biggest scales in the universe to the smallest scales, I've been at UC San Diego as a professor for this is my 18th year here. And most of my time I'm teaching in one way or another, either it's, uh, it's, it's via my students, undergraduates, PhD students, um, or I am teaching via my YouTube channel, Dr. Brian Keating, or try to do a lot of exposés on physics from the perspective of someone who's actually looking through telescopes, not someone who's, you know, waxing, you know, philosophical about wormholes and black holes and other kind of holes. I don't know, but, but the, the whole, the whole notion of, of, of what is possible to learn without as much hype as typically gets applied. So that's kind of what I, what I do for uh, on a daily basis. Got it. Okay. Um, and what's funny is you may have answered it somewhat in there, but this stuff is so over my head that I'm still going to ask. So how would you describe like what is astrophysics? And then I have another question I want to ask, but what's astrophysics? Yeah, so astrophysics is a study of the stars, astro, using the principles and techniques of physics. So using uh, telescopes, using computers, using uh, the human brain, which is a type of computer, an infinitely complex computer uh, in some ways, and applying those tools to understand the origin of the universe, the biggest, the biggest thing that there possibly is. Perhaps are there multiple universes? That's another question we think about a lot. Uh, all the way from the biggest scales down to the smallest scales. And that, and that actually reminds me for your uh, for your viewing audience and your fans on Instagram and wherever else, I want to send you uh, all who are listening out there in the Tyler uh, Authors United and the universe of authors, I want to send you a meteorite. So this is actually a fragment of an asteroid that blew apart, was formed, first of all, 14, 4 billion years ago in our region of the galaxy and orbited around, eventually crashed into Earth, we think about 6,000 years ago, and landed in, in Argentina. And it's made of highly magnetized and magnetic materials, semi-exotic materials. Uh, and it's actually from space. And I have the authenticity certificate to just prove to you out there if you should doubt uh, my veracity. So to do that, <laughs> I can only send it since I'm a, a humble professor at a public university. So I can only send it to the U.S. Uh, only. Uh, but if you go to my mailing list, briankeating.com slash list, uh, you can enter in your address. You can join my mailing list if you're not in the country. But uh, but if you are, I'll send you, uh, if you're one of the first 100 people to do this and and also follow me on Instagram, which is uh, Dr. Brian Keating, I'll send out a meteorite. And I'll send you one too, Tyler. All right, I was going to say that. And that, that was actually going to be a question. Is there a limit? <laughs> so the limit, it's the first 100? It's the first 100, oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, I, you have a huge audience and <laughs> millions of people follow you. So yeah, I would kind of trying to make it random but uh but yeah uh, hopefully hopefully I, actually, I might even uh i'm not even kidding for all the listeners i'm just letting you know i might pull a little fagazi fagazi here because i might have all my family message you first to make sure that we get we're gonna piece together this whole thing and have the whole thing <laughs> i have a big family so all right oh, i'm just well, kidding, guys i won't do that too. that's awesome um, i mean my brother i'm gonna make sure he's the oh first yeah yeah, yeah. Regardless of the size. <laughs> so um Okay, so what I want to ask next is, what were you, when you were, and this is kind of typically my first question, but I always like to find, like, what's the root of things? So before you were doing any of this stuff, astrophysics, like, when you were younger, did you see yourself doing any of this, or is it completely different than how you saw life? You know, I always say I never thought I would be doing it any more than I thought I'd be, you know, an ice cream taster, or, or a wizard or, you know, something like that. You know, it's like, 
I do it for for free. I would, uh, you know, I'm I'm a public, you know, employee, so maybe yeah. it's as close to free as possible. Not like those private Ivy League school professors that I work with. But but the point being that it's um it's a job that I you know that I love so much that I did do it you know as a kid with a tiny little telescope. Like if you're listening, I'm holding up uh, one of my first telescopes, just a tiny little you know twenty dollar uh, telescope that that allowed me to see the same things that. People like Galileo, Isaac Newton, and, and other people had seen uh, in the exact same way that they saw it. So what, what really is interesting about astronomy, unlike other branches of science, you know, including uh, studying the brain or studying uh, the microscopic subatomic particles, is that you can actually feel the visceral experience of the very first people who saw the very same things that you're seeing through a small telescope. In other words, when you look up at a, uh, with a telescope and you look at, at the moon, You'll see the exact same craters that Galileo saw. You'll see the rings of Saturn that he saw. You'll see the moons of Jupiter that he discovered. And they were kind of my first tutors, these authors, uh, going back, you know, to the, you know, 1600s and having these long dead people have a conversation with me throughout history uh, felt like I was along with them for the very first time. And, and you can't do that with you know, unless you happen to have a large hadron collider in your basement, you know, which I'm doubting, you know, if you don't even have a meteorite, I doubt you have a particle collider in your, in your bedroom. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> next, yeah, we'll do a follow-up podcast. We'll get you one of those for the, for the next uh, one right. listener. I'll send out a particle accelerator, but you can't do that. You can't experience, you know, what does it feel like to uh, discover penicillin for the, it's very difficult to do that. On the other hand, you can see all these phenomena even from New York City, even from, you know, the East Coast, Miami, you know, wherever you're listening to this, uh, you can see it and, and feel it. And that's the important thing. And so getting connected to these wonderful authors, these thinkers, um, and, and realizing that they, you know, they are human beings. They're not these, they're not aliens. They're not, you know, otherworldly supercomputers. They're human beings. And they have human emotions. And you can feel those same emotions, even if you can't reduplicate those same equations or the same experiments. Got it. So you mentioned one thing earlier too, is uh, I think you said duplicate universes. So when I, um, I think it's come up probably multiple times actually on, uh, I listen to a lot of Rogan and he, do you believe in the thing where, and maybe this is what you meant when you say multiple universes, but where there's like other, there's multiple of us, right? So it's like, there's a hundred Tylers in other universes. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, you're shortchanging it. Yeah, it's way more. Than that. Yeah, so that's the theory of the multiverse, which is really a continuation of what is uh, known as the Copernican principle. So Nicholas Copernicus was a Polish scientist in the 1400s and 1500s. And he came up with this idea that the earth is not the center of the universe, which many people had conjectured to be the case since antiquity, that the earth is the heaviest thing and everything falls towards the heavier uh, center of things. And therefore the earth uh, being the heaviest thing, everything falls towards it. So it must be in the center. Uh, and this was just, you know, thought of by Aristotle and, and other geniuses, but never tested, which is kind of amazing. They just assumed that this was true, but they never went out and verified it experimentally, observationally, astronomically. So uh, once that was postulated, then it fell to people like uh, like Galileo, my my superhero. And and what he did is he tried to collect evidence using a telescope, using a similar kind of thing as this uh, little, tele you know, one of my dreams is to have Keating brand telescopes, you know, and I can do merch and, and stuff, you know, someday uh, with, maybe we, we'll do a, we'll do a collab on, on uh, Instagram, but I am in man. <laughs> That's easy. So the, the conjecture was that, you know, the earth is just a planet and the earth not only is just a planet, but the sun is just a star. And this was heretical back in 1600. In fact, uh, Giordano Bruno famously conjectured that every single star was a sun like the earth, like the earth's sun or the, or the star that seemed to orbit around the earth. And that was, uh, that was heretical. So he was actually burned at the stake for that in 1600. <clears throat> but then later Galileo came up with some, what he thought was proof that the earth was in motion. And not only was it in motion, it was orbiting around the sun. It took hundreds of a hundred years or more to prove. And, and then he got into trouble with the Catholic church. Um, as I recount my first book, Losing the Nobel Prize. Uh, and it wasn't really that surprising that people would then take this notion that we're not the only planet, we're not the only star, uh, the Milky Way galaxy is not the only galaxy. Why could there not be other universes that contain all those other objects? 
in some other form. And in fact, once you admit that there could be one, it's very difficult to say there couldn't be an infinite number. That's why I said when you said there's 100 Tylers, you know, there's not only like 100 Tylers, there's 100 Tylers that host a podcast called Into the Impossible. There's a thousand Brian's that host the Authors Unite. You know, so there, every possibility plays out in this scenario called the multiverse. Now you have to ask, is that scientific? And what are the reasons why people think there could be multiple universes of which ours is but an infinitesimal speck, according to these thinkers. And actually, that is the branch of science, of physics, of cosmology that I am most interested in and most participating of. And, and that is the search for the origin of the universe. Was it a singular event? Was it multiple events? Are there multiple universes? That's what my research focuses on, no pun intended. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. Usually it says someone say, I got a simple question, you know, like, can you explain <laughs> the multiverse? And it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically, it's a consequence. It's not really a scientific theory, you know, like people ask me, do you believe in the multiverse or do you believe in global warming? You know, I don't, I don't like say I believe in things. Like I say, you know, here's like this, if you're watching, you know, you'll see this. It's a crystal ball. I see I'm upside down in it and then I can get reflected back and forth. Anyway, this is my crystal ball. I look at it. But if I drop my crystal ball and I catch it, I, I don't say like, I believe in gravity. No, I have evidence for gravity. I have evidence for astronomical processes that blew up a star that pre cre uh, created an iron, nickel, cobalt, terbium meteorite fragment that a hundred of your listeners will get, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I have evidence for those processes. But the multiverse is very flexible. It accommodates an infinite possibility, um, uh, contingent possibility. So there's no one particular measurement, which will inscrutably reveal every aspect of the multiverse as solidly as we have evidence for evolution, global climate change, and the theory of gravity. So it's a different type of science, and it almost borders on religion. It, it really... And, you know, I, you know, you don't ask people normally don't ask. I happen to be religious. I'm Jewish in my case. Um, I don't sit there and say, like, I have evidence and proof of God, because if I had proof of God, then why is there more than one religion? Why is there more than one God? Why is there? And I, you know, so I don't debate things that are a matter of almost like taste. Right. You can't. I, I happen not to like fish either, which my kids always tease me about. I always want to sneak in like some tuna into my uh, veggie rolls or whatever, but, uh, but I can detect, I can detect like one milligram of tuna, you know, from like a mile. I just hate it, but you can't, there's nothing you can do to convince me of that. Like I, I should really like tuna. No, I, I always say Tyler, by the way, you know, if you like fish, people always say like, why don't you like fish? And I say, what's the highest compliment that you can pay to someone's fish, you say it doesn't taste like fish, right? It's got chips, it's got bad, bad. It's, I just skipped the middleman, Tyler. I'd go straight to the I don't eat the fish. But anyway, <laughs> the whole point is religion asks you to accept stuff on faith, and that's fine. Um, it doesn't ask you, you know, for proof or evidence. I know that some of your listeners will probably say, Oh, no, there's proof that Jesus Christ died for my sins, or whatever. We can we can talk about that some other time. But from a scientific, dispositive, evidentiary-based thing that would hold up in a court of law, so to speak. That's the reason that you get credit for having faith, not that you don't get credit for believing in gravity, right? You're an idiot if you don't believe in gravity. So you get credit for believing in Jesus or believing in Moses, whatever you want, um, if you believe in God, right? So that's, you have to believe in it. You don't have necessary physical scientific evidence for it. You can have arguments for it. And I've debated people on both sides, religious and non-religious about that. But anyway, the point is we don't have any physical evidence of the multiverse yet. That doesn't mean we'll never have physical evidence of the multiverse. That doesn't mean that we'll never encounter some uh, some properties of our universe that give us circumstantial evidence that the multiverse exists. And that, again, is exactly the research that I'm invested in. All right. So uh, next question is, because um, there's two, and I don't know what it's going to... Well, first, there's an article, and I'm assuming, based on what you just said, it's more of uh, just a headline. I didn't read the full article, but it says, I don't believe in gravity, exclamation point. So what's up with that, man? Because you just said you did. <laughs> no, no. So I said, I don't have to believe I have in gravity. I have evidence for gravity. Okay, right? gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, right, so perfect. Exactly. Flip this on the book. I'm not listening well enough. That's what's happening. <laughs> Got it. I see where you're going. Okay, fair enough. Um, and now, oh, what was the next question now? Don't do this to me. Uh, oh, so um, the idea of like simulation. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. So that's really fascinating. That, that term, the simulation hypothesis, 
is generally credited to a British scientist by the name of Nick Ballstrom. Uh, and he's actually going to be a guest on my podcast, Into the Impossible. I've interviewed 13 Nobel Prize winners, uh, a couple of billionaires, uh, many, many authors, almost everybody's an author. Uh, but I, I like to give back. Uh, and I really appreciate what you do, Tyler, because you're you know, basically paying stuff back and forward at the same time. I only like paying people back because I became a scientist because of great science writers from, you know, Isaac Asimov, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, you know, people like, um, uh, you know, just, just all these great Einstein and Galileo. And, and those are the reason I became a scientist. So my small part is, as you may know, you know, very, you don't make that much money writing a popular science book. <laughs> um, and so uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I became very interested in paying back authors whose, you know, book tours were canceled, basically. And so I started my podcast in 2020 and, and I've had um, 200 authors in those two years, so I'm cranking them out. Uh, but anyway, getting back to simulation hypothesis, one of the authors is a man by the name of Dr. Uh, Nick Ballstrom. And he has this, um, this book called Super Intelligence, which the basic philosophy is this, and I'm going to ask him about this, so you'll have to tune in. But the, the philosophy is that if you take the progress that humans have made in computing, uh, building computers, uh, building semiconductors, now building superconducting quantum computers, et cetera. And you just have a mild extrapolation of any amount that you like. Uh, it could be a thousandth of a percent per century that they're going to get that. Now, they happen to be improving in, by a factor of two. You know, so, so you know, 100% improvement every year or every two years. So that's way faster than what I just said. But the beauty of what's called exponential growth is that over long enough time scales, uh, anything is possible as long as you don't violate basic laws of physics like conservation of energy, um, you know, uh, and so forth. So the postulate is that just as we're growing fifty percent, you know, per per year or one hundred percent per year, these computers could be growing in some other civilization, or they may have already happened. In other words, like history could be very, very long, and we essentially are living in a simulation that somebody else created. And the reason they were able to do that is that they got a start a million years ago before us. And just like my kids, uh, you know, play my, a lot of Minecraft and Fortnite and stuff like that. And I like to like play with flight simulators and do stuff like that. Those are really rudimentary. Uh, but but given a million years, even at a thousandth of a percent per year improvement, there's a lot of a percent in that uh, in that improvement. So given enough time, you'll have super intelligence. You'll have a computer that can simulate every single event, every single. This is the this is the theory. I mean, I have some objections to it, but I just want to outline what the concept is. And so eventually, you'll be able to basically reproduce reality. And if you reproduce reality, for there may be people or entities or an intelligence that would want to simulate the past. Or simulate, you know, things that are much, much simpler than it, uh, like SimCity or something. Uh, so that we'd basically be like a video game or Matrix, an apparition within the incredibly advanced supercomputer of the year one million. So uh, this is the theory, and that uh, suggests that we are uh, essentially avatars in a, in a digital or uh, simulated environment. And because our inputs, our sensory inputs at some level reduce to physical phenomena. In other words, you and I are talking over the internet. The internet is composed of a lot of wires and, and antennas and, and computers and so forth. And, uh, but eventually- so What do you want to turn on? Uh-oh, so that's my, uh, I have a digital assistant here. Uh, okay. Computer, stop. So I changed its name from A L E X A to. Okay. <laughs> That's actually I can perfect. do funny things with that. I can say like uh, "computer, turn on the plug." There we go. All right. So turn on the plug. Anyway, um, the point being that any sort of and I should change the waking up word. Actually, this is good because because I, I say the word C O M P U T E R a lot. So maybe <laughs> yeah, I'll, try to, I'll change it to something. Uh, you know, Tyler, come on, turn off the lights. <laughs> Dude, if you do, that would make my day. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but eventually after these um, electronic impulses traverse the country, you're on the East Coast, right? So they go across the country and uh, then they get transduced and converted into analog signals and you hear stuff and you see light. Well, those just get picked up by receptors in our brain and there's no way to dis disentangle that we could be simulations right now, the proverbial brain in a jar. 
um, or maybe even not a brain. Uh, so, so these are the kind of conjectures that that Nick and and his um, and his colleagues and and collaborators have have conjectured. And it's my job as an experimentalist to kind of poke at it and not prove him right. I mean, that's a that's a fallacy that I'm often confronted with. People are like, well, what do you want to discover? You know, what are you hoping to find? Yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said, oh, I'm hoping to find nothing. Uh, <laughs> but but when you start to think about what you want to be true, it really compromises your behavior as a scientist. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else. But the bottom line is what I should be doing if I'm a good scientist is looking for ways that that he could be proven wrong, not right. And that's a misconception. Most people think science is about proving things right, but really it's about proving other ideas wrong. And then what you're left with is, is closer approximation to quote unquote, the truth. Wow. Yo, that's so interesting. Cause I, okay. I didn't know that, but that just was a great comparison to like writing a book actually. Right. So what I always tell people, and I'm curious about your process on yeah. writing books then, but before we even go there, I, I do want to know what some of your objections are then, but real quick though, just to make a point is with a book, the process that I always explain to people is you want to get it all out of your head, right? So the first draft is just like a complete mess. And yeah. then you take away all the stuff that's unnecessary, and then you're left with the book. So it's kind of similar with, I guess, uh, a scientific thing. I, I don't know the correct words, but meaning like you have this big idea with all these maybe other ideas surrounding it, and then you poke at it and remove all the stuff that you can maybe prove or believe is inaccurate and then you're left with the most potential accurate thing yeah <laughs> I, I think i think there's a lot of truth to that so to answer the second question first and then the first question i'll never answer under any no i'm just kidding i'll answer the <laughs> writing process such as it is uh although you know thankfully i'm on hi hiatus for a little bit i've written three books in four years and uh wow. you know start a production company for audiobooks and, and videos and stuff but um yeah the 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 notion of uh of science can proceed in many different ways so have you ever heard of the scientific method maybe we're in high school they said here's a scientific method you know so it's sort of collect materials, you know, and then, you know, look, I have a hypothesis and, you know, that I've never done that. Okay. <laughs> Newsflash, <laughs> never like, let me, let me collect some materials and then go to the laboratory and then I'll have a hypothesis. No, it, usually what happens in science is that you find a discrepancy between what is already known, uh, believed to be true and what uh, further improvements in technology or in, in theory modeling, et cetera, now seem to suggest. So give an example. So for thousands of years, they thought the earth was flat. Uh, people collected some evidence uh, for, for its non being flat, its sphericity. Uh, and that was then overturned this notion that it was flat. Now it turns out that the earth is not nearly as perfect a sphere as my crystal ball here. It's actually because the earth has been rotating for billions of years. Uh, after it condensed and cooled out of this primordial soup that some of which I will send to people that go to briankeating.com slash list, uh, that, um, that it actually bulges at the equator a little bit, like a, a little bit like a kind of um, uh, hula hoop or a football, if you like, or some kind of shape that's a little hard to describe called a, a spheroid. Now, that's also not accurate, 100% accurate. In other words, the, the sphere is a much better improvement over it being flat, right? You can you can actually go and measure its, its non-flatness on the surface of the earth and you can measure it from space. What's much harder is to measure the deviation from being a perfect sphere, but it can be done. Um, similarly, the, the notion that the earth is uh, the center of the solar system, it was very difficult to disprove. And once it was disproven, it was realized, well, no, the sun is the center of the, of the solar system. Actually, they thought the sun was the center of the universe, uh, but that wasn't true. Um, and then they thought the sun is the center of our solar system. It turns out that's not exactly true either. The center of the sun uh, is not the center of the solar system. It's actually a little bit farther away from it. So you can keep going. And then each time we did that, we learned something new, either about matter or about the force that we call gravity, for example where we learned about our uh, our position in, in the galaxy. Then we learned how the galaxy is moving. So all these things would never have occurred if we didn't believe that previous generations were wrong. And so my, my podcast is called the Into the Impossible podcast because that's one of the great Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who is a great writer and scientist, 
and I try to emulate in, in some ways. He wasn't perfect, <laughs> but but anyway, uh, he had this law uh, that stated you've probably heard it: any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, that's a quote, you know, that we like to hear. Sometimes Elon Musk uh, inverts it and says any sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from technology. Uh, but he had another quote um, that that uh, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. And some of it actually said science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. In other words, not the knowledge of experts, but the ignorance that if you just said this guy, Aristotle, who thought the sun was not the you know, center of the solar system, but the earth was, if you just said, well, he's pretty smart. I mean, he came up with all of philosophy. <laughs> you know, he came up with all these laws of logic. He discovered that whales are mammals. You know, this is a great guy, but he was like totally wrong when it came to physics. But if we said, oh, he's very smart, we should just trust him. We'd never have the laws of Galileo. And then if we thought Galileo was infallible and perfect, we'd never have Isaac Newton. And if we had Isaac Newton, we'd never have uh, we'd never have Einstein. And we'd never had Einstein, we'd never have Keating. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not putting myself in this. <laughs> All right, I will, I will. If you insist, if you insist. But but the, the point is, you know, you have to have a little bit of what we call chutzpah. You know, you have to have a little bit of arrogance, but I call it humble arrogance. You have to like know that you're completely fallible. You're likely to be wrong because you're doing super hard stuff that no one was able to do before you. But you have to have a little swagger. You know, if you're just like, oh, I'm terrible. I'll never be Einstein. I shouldn't even start. You'll never start. There's a lot of impetus to, you know, remain stationary in the universe, uh, even though that's not the correct law of physics. So that's a long way away of, of describing, you know, science and what we're trying to do with things like the simulation hypothesis. So you might ask, well, how could you falsify? How could you prove the, the simulation hypothesis wrong? Well, it would be like you know, some kind of glitch in the matrix. If it's, if it's a complete, uh, I, as I said, we have to convert these digital signals from Zoom to analog audio signals. Now those a analog audio signals are, are not quantized. In other words, we have like a digital to analog converter that then changes the, the sound into what sound, seems like sound waves, but it's actually discrete little levels of amplification. Now, what if that was true um, uh, but but everywhere we look, in other words, we look at the sunlight and it wouldn't be like a perfect spectrum. We look really closely and there's like, oh no, there, there's only like a, some number of finite number of photons coming to hit your eye. Well, that'd be kind of weird because we don't think there's any physical process that can do that. And and then we'd start to notice things like, well, if someone's not observing a tree falling in the, in the woods or they, the simulation didn't think I was going out to the forest to listen, but I put some, you know, transistor there, amplifier there that's analog and it didn't recreate it perfectly. Oh, now I discovered I'm being simulated. It's like the Truman Show or, you know, the light bulb falls from the sky. Yeah. So you're basically looking uh, for glitches in the simulation. Now, I've described very simplistic ones that obviously a super intelligent being would realize, but there are certain things that you could force the comp the force the simulator into spending an infinite amount of energy, which doesn't really exist to replicate. And that would be very hard to, to figure out. Um, but at the ultimate level, what interests me, because it's, it's currently not falsifiable, in other words, I can't prove it wrong today. Uh, we have hunches that it might be wrong, but it might be right. Um, that because of that, you have to believe or not believe in it. Like I said, we don't have evidence for it. So then it kind of goes into notions of theology and religion, right? Because let's say you have a simulation and let's say you're running a simulation in your house and, and, and you get attached to it. I don't know. I mean, I, I had like early computers in the 80s and 90s, like Commodore 64. And I used to have um, a really good, I was good at programming, but I didn't have enough money to buy a, a tape drive. So back then you had to have like record a program on a piece of magnetic tape, which probably you don't even remember, but... <laughs> but um, we had it wasn't even a disc back then. It was so expensive to even think. So you had tape, and you could. So I couldn't turn off my computer because if I turned off my computer, the memory would get erased every time you turned on and off the computer. So my older brother would come in sometimes and just like turn off the power, you know, just to piss me off, uh, <laughs> as brothers or older brothers are wont to do. And um, but but you know, if you didn't have this, you know, infinite budget as the civilization that's simulating us, then you might be you know, the jig might be up. <laughs> so yeah. right now, I, I think that there, there is a kind of a parallel structure between the simulation hypothesis, the multiverse and religion, because 
when I created this program, the last thing I wanted to do is turn it off, right? So there were like, imagine if there were like beings in there that could feel pain. Um, would I have the right morally, ethically to turn off the simulation or causing a pain if I could avoid it? So that's the same kind of questions that you think about theodicy, you know, the existence of, of evil in a world that's good or good in the world that's evil. Um, where do those come from? So it, it is more interesting in my mind from the way it makes us think about our notion of philosophy and religion than actually as a scientific hypothesis. Got it. It's so interesting. <laughs> I'm just thinking there's going to be a lot of good clips from this episode. Um, so, okay. So a lot of our, just based on the business that I run, I've been doing it about 11 years now. A lot of our listeners are authors or want to be authors. Um, so I definitely, I know you just slightly hinted at it, but at some yeah. point I would love to hear more about your audiobook thing. Cause some of our listeners might be interested in that, but, yeah. um, or do you want to start with that? And then I want to hear about the, your three books in the process, but what is the audiobook thing? Might as well. So um, going back to like uh, my my kind of early formative years as a scientist, as a as just a kid getting interested in astronomy, getting my first telescope, um, that was my encounter with books and and with the great minds of history. And one of the greatest minds is Galileo. And Galileo did more, you know, for the scientific method and and, and physics in general, and obviously with astronomy as well, than basically any other scientist, just by sheer number of discoveries. And that's because he basically had this first mover advantage where he was, you know, writing the first books ever about these phenomena because he had invented the technology or improved the technology so much, it gave him a factor of 10x on his nearest competition. So, and that was a telescope. He didn't invent it, but he improved it 10 times over what it was literally what it was before. So he had this huge advantage and he used it and he capitalized on it uh, and he made all these low hanging fruit, you know, discoveries that people, you know, were, were just uh, flabbergasted by. So I encountered him in, uh, as a 12 year old, 13 year old, and I just want to be like him. And, and I talk about in my first book, losing the Nobel prize. I talk about how I wanted to replicate everything except how he was tortured, you know, and imprisoned for the last years of his life for preaching, you know, sort of a doctrine that was antithetical to what the Catholic Church at that time was believed to espouse. And it turns out he wasn't tortured, but but anyway, let, let's just say that he, that he had a not so uh, so wonderful retirement. You know, the last nine years were pretty tough. Um, so I realized that what was happening was that he was communicating with me, you know, from beyond the grave uh, with his written works. And and yet, even as a kid, I couldn't really, he's such beautiful language. He is almost like a poet. Uh, he's one of the best writers, not just science writers in history, in my opinion. Uh, but, um, and so later in life, I, I really couldn't absorb as much as he had written. He wrote millions of words. Um, and so his most famous book is called The Dialogue. It's actually the full title is called The Dialogue on Two Chief World Systems. And about uh, two years ago, I was doing a, a video for this um, organization called Prager University, which does uh, which does a lot of like short videos. But they have this thing called a book club where Michael Knowles, who's a very conservative guy, uh, but he uh, but he actually likes to read interesting books. And so he asked me, uh, you know, would you like to do a reading of of Galileo's dialogue for the first ever science discussion? Now, most of their audience are, you know. Christian conservatives and so forth. And you know, as a Jewish guy and a scientist, I was like, well, they don't get to hear about science very often. So let me take this opportunity to teach them a little bit about how scientists think. And because I had already become a you know world-renowned podcaster and you know, famous, I'm just joking. <laughs> no. I, everything I was doing was as audio, you know, it was like this. And it's addictive, as you know, to do podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. Um, especially when you have these brilliant people that come on that are kind of like your co-host and all you have to do is read their books and, and, and that's not so small thing. So I had a hundred books, you know, I want to read and I was like, okay, well, let me just listen. You know, I'm not having Galileo on my show, but I have to instead investigate him. Like he was a guest almost. So I was like, I'll just download the audiobook. Doesn't exist. So it didn't exist. And I was like, oh man, now I got to read 430 pages. Uh, so I said, you know what? I love this guy so much. Uh, and he's done so much. And it'd be a shame if the world never had this the dialogue is actually like a play. It's like three people talking over, it's a trialogue over three days or four days in Venice, uh, discussing the nature of reality, just like you and I are doing, uh, except, you know, this was really at a time when 
nothing was understood and it was a dangerous time to be discussing some of these ideas. Uh, and so I, I got the rights to the, to the translation. Turns out it's owned by my, the University of California, which really doesn't have anything to do with where I am at UC San Diego. But, but nevertheless, I had through friends of friends got in touch with the rights holders and got the translation. Now, anyone can translate and read an audiobook by anyone who's been dead as long as he has been dead. But the translator, Stillman Drake, still was not, he wasn't alive, but he has a very active estate. You know, he only died you know, maybe 20 years ago or something. So uh, I couldn't just use his, his translation without permission. I don't think that would be intellectually honest either. So got the rights. I owe, you know, a uh, 12% per year royalty on the massive profits that are, you know, paying for my, my current Lamborghini and my down payment <laughs> on my future Lamborghini. Uh, so anyway, uh, I haven't, I haven't recouped the, uh, the cost of producing this, but I realized I had to start like a little production company. So I did, it's called Big Bang Productions. And my goal is to actually translate uh, all these great, not translate, but to record in audio form, these books by Galileo, by Darwin, by uh, Albert Einstein, because they're so old, they're in the public domain, but people don't have, there's no audiobooks for them. So it's a great opportunity. Um, and uh, no one else did it. And so I did it with two other physicists, both of them are Italians. And, uh, and one, uh, another guy who won the Nobel Prize, and another guy who should win the Nobel Prize, and the woman who is the director of the Large Hadron Collider's home institution. And we made it uh, really kind of like dramatic reading of this wonderful book. And then I further took the opportunity. I said, well, now I've got all his words in digitized form, which didn't exist either. In other words, the even the, you know, the ebook form didn't exist. So now I have that. And I there are a lot of what are called artificial intelligence engines that you can like basically upload text to, and then it will try to predict how you might write. So it will take like my book and it will write something in my voice, for example. But now I could, my, my figurative voice, but now I can actually do it with my literal voice and I could do it with my, with all the writings of Galileo, um, something like GPT-3. And so I'm exploring the possibility of, of taking that and making like artificial Galileo and then you could query him because I'm a good teacher. I think I'm a good teacher, uh, but I'm not as good as he was. And he's not alive anymore. Now imagine every single person has an app. Like I want to ask Galileo like about the simulation. I mean, imagine that you don't need Brian Keating on, on authors United. You just need Galileo. You need this <laughs> app. So that's my goal is to, is to eventually go there. And in the meantime, I'm also doing things like, as you might know, these books are so old. There aren't many first editions of them that still exist. It's not like today where they print off a million of them, you know, for a popular author. Uh, but but instead, uh, you know, so now uh, I've explored making, I've actually made the first NFTs ever from some of the hand-drawn images that he had in his books. And, you know, I'm using those to eventually want to generate enough um, enough interest so that we can buy for the university that I work for, you know, we could buy and donate like a first edition copy, which is like probably $100,000. Uh, and then everybody who contributes and owns a piece of the NFT could then interact with it in some form or another. We have scholarship, we'd have research on the document, um, kind of like people want to do a few months ago with the buying the constitution or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I have grandiose goals for it, but it all stemmed from the fact that it was an itch that wasn't being scratched by anybody. No one had ever made this audio book. So that was my, that's my third book. It's audio only, um, but you know, there's download PDFs and stuff like that for the images. But, um, but yeah, it's on my website, briankeating.com slash dialogue. And um, yeah, I'm really just having a lot of fun with it. It's uh, it's been it's been a great experience. And then recording, you know, it took took a couple of months for me and my three other colleagues, four other colleagues to record. And but now that it's done, understand the process of publication. I've got the um, the logistics kind of ironed out. I've got a great editor um, uh, uh, on the East Coast who who um, proof listened to it and uh, edited it. And it's it's so much easier than it probably was five years ago even for sure what, what was it like recording it was it ever frustrating at all? <laughs> i mean it was there's a lot of what they call pickups i mean i didn't do read the audiobooks for either one of my first two okay. written books um except for the i did the intro and the outro and one chapter of my second book which is called think like a nobel prize winner it's kind of a self-help book for yeah. you know people in science and engineering and technology but anybody who collaborates and competes because you know it's there's no such thing as like you could be a car salesman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
and you're competing, but you might also be collaborating with somebody in the showroom floor or the mechanics or whatever. So I wrote it from that perspective. How do people at the highest levels of human imagination, of consciousness, of computing, of physics, of astronomy, how do they work with others, work independently? What are their workflows, their habits, their tactics, et cetera, to produce, you know, by definition, because they've won the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, the highest accolade worthy material. And so I did read the intro and the outro for that. But yeah, this is much more involved because there were so many other readers and, um, and, and just getting the rights. And it's like a script more than it was just like when I narrated my book, this, the intro and outro uh, for Think Like a Nobel Prize winner. You know, it's just like a linear thing. I just read. I don't have to like pause here and then, oh, my friend Carlo Rovelli, who's a world famous author, you know, oh, now he's going to, you know, that was mentally taxing. But again, my my editor, Nathan uh, Roxburgh and Tim Bader, they just did an amazing job, like color coding out all my parts. And they're, you know, it just it was great. And so now I have this wonderful um, template to make the great books of science popularization come to life. And I hope to do more of that when I recover. Yeah, man. So that, and then what was, so I guess the third book is, it's different enough. So for the first two though, what was like, what was your writing process for those? Yeah, the first one was kind of unique. So the first thing I should say for any author is you should only write a book if you can't not write a book. In other words, if you have some story you know, that's worthy of telling, like I had done things like I did a TED talk and I had done, um, you know, talks uh, other places. And everyone always said, oh, you should write a book. You're so good at explaining things. And, you know, I think I'm okay at doing that. I think I'm a good lecturer and a teacher. I love giving talks. I love, you know, being in person and, and so forth. But i never felt like, oh, well, I had a story that only I could tell, not like, Neil deGrasse Tyson could also tell it. And, and, you know, he doesn't have a job as a professor and he doesn't have young kids running around and, and so forth. So I felt like, you know, for me to do this means I'm going to say no to a lot of other things, including sometimes my students and sometimes my kids and sometimes my wife. And um, so you should really only do it if you have to do it. In other words, if you're a party to a story or if you have an angle or if you have some insights uh, into some phenomenon, and it could be, you know, in my case, a science phenomena, um, and not do it for money. Cause I mean, I got paid way below minimum wage for my first one. The advance was not great. And, and the second one, I, I, I used a, what it's called a self-publishing, but with author input. And that's called Lions Crest Publishing. They publish like David Goggins book. And so I work with an editor and, and she, she and I would talk and she would transcribe my interviews and my commentary on my interviews from the podcast with these nine men who had won the Nobel Prize. So the second book is like the self-help book, Think Like a Nobel Prize winner. And that involves the distillation of all these podcasts that I had the honor of doing. And I felt like it would be bad, you know, because I love podcasts, but I never go, do you ever go back and like listen to a podcast? I mean, your audience will go back to this one many, many times, I'm sure. But <laughs> it's pretty rare I go back and listen to like, oh, what was episode 47? Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I, not the ones I, I, they're so long, but like Rogan or Lex, I mean, three hours, I can't do it twice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I, I told point. Lex, like I, when I did the Lex Freeman podcast, which I love and I love Lex and we've become kind of friendly. Yeah. I was just like this, you know, I might not even listen to this whole, like, it's so hard. My interview is four hours long and i looked yesterday it's got 1.2 million views which means that just the views not the audio and he's more popular on audio i think so that's like 8 million probably 8 million hours people have listened to me and lex drawn on for it and it's awesome i mean i love it, it i've is. gotten so many and you know i wouldn't know you right if, if we didn't yeah. if i didn't do it and i'm hoping to go back later this year for a part two but again that's kind of like a thing like oh i you know people are like oh you should go on rogan i'm like all right you know it'd be great but i also feel like you know after this podcast, you know, like once you go to Rogan, where do you go after that? Like, you're not going to go on Rogan like every week. And so I've, I've started to think like, well, maybe I can make my own Rogan, you know, for my own podcast. And just like, then I just go on my own podcast. Like I don't need to go on other people's podcasts as much. Uh, although I do like it because it's, it's honestly, it gives me a chance to just talk about my work and that's fun and my ideas. Um, but so yeah, the process, the second book was much easier in some ways. On the other hand, it was a lot more work because it was many, many hours of reading and preparation and interviews. And, and I worked really hard on the podcast. And so I'd already done the legwork and I just thought it was a shame if I didn't do that. But notice what I'm doing. Uh, and then my first book is very different. That was like sitting my ass in a chair 
typing for four hours before I taught, you know, I had little kids running around. I was about to have another kid and, um, you know, just really trying to cram it all in before my daughter was born. And, um, you know, that, that just was addictive because I had experienced this event where I had come close. My team had come close to actually winning the Nobel prize, which is my dream since I was a kid and then snatched away by the jaws of defeat. And and what that felt like, it's a memoir of a young scientist trying to unravel the mysteries of the universe, grappling with death and and loss of his father, in my case, the suicide of my close mentor, my teacher, and um, and the struggles of competition and collaboration that went into trying to unravel if there is a multiverse. And that's really what the essence of my science goes to. So that was, that came out of me easier. And I was a hundred percent solo. I mean, I had copy editors and that's traditionally published. That was with Norton. There's a big firm in the, in New York city and you know, they're, they're slower. Also, it took two years from the contract, the initial agent, you know, I didn't need an agent for my second book. And then for my third book, I'm the, I'm the publisher. So I'm on the hook for everything, including paying out royalties to my co-ed narrators and to the rights holders and to, you know, paying for illustrations and stuff. So um, they're very different models, self-published. Yeah. Uh, what know. are your thoughts actually overall? Um, so I'll just say like, um, yeah. love Lion, Lion Crest, actually, we do a lot of work with them. We actually just, um, Javon, the CEO of Scribe, we just did a launch for his book like a couple of weeks ago, actually. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. So like, I'm very familiar with them, but like, I'm just curious on your overall thoughts of you, you've actually done like three different models right yeah. um i guess scribe is i guess you'd call like a service publisher but yeah. they're still managing it all for you so you've done traditional service and then self so mm-hmm. what what i guess what do you like best or pros and cons i think, or, or? I, think I like i i you know i can't say either one and any of them is better than the other uh, there there is a there is a thrill in like oh, I have an agent and then the agent sold the book and then there's a bidding war, you know, between, you yeah. know, and it didn't, that actually didn't happen. I mean, I had like 20, my agent submitted the first book to 20 publishers and only Norton actually gave an advance, which, you know, uh, the, they hopefully are happy with because I think it's sold pretty well. And, um, but, you know, you'll never know because it's it's hidden behind, you know, the Ma- Madison Avenue, uh, all the apparatus, but I love those people and I, I talked to them and I would use them again. I'd use my agent again, but the process is, you know, as they say, sclerotic, it takes so long. And for something that was like quick and I really wanted to get it out. Um, and I, you know, I'm listening to, to other podcasters, like my very good friend, James Altucher, who wrote the forward to my second book, along with a Nobel prize winner. So he's got that in common with, uh, with, with me and, and being close to Nobel greatness. You know, there, uh, I think that he's, he's basically got the right idea, at least for somebody like me you know, you should, you should basically just sequentially go through. So I've got, you know, I've done self-published, you know, a submission, publish, whatever the technical name is that you use, and then yeah. a traditional publisher. And he's like, well, just, you know, just keep doing that cycle again, it works, you know? So, um, and I think in doing that, I could respond very flexibly if like, I already have two or three or four new Nobel prize winners for the next uh, volume of think like a Nobel prize winner. My goal is every, you know, 18 months to just replicate that as these self-help books come out and, and these people get older and, you know, you just want to capture their wisdom while they're still available. Um, yeah. And then the, as I said, the audiobook market is a blue ocean because nobody's doing like Darwin, you know, it's, it's always Neil Gaiman, or, you know, whatever. Um, but they're not doing the classics anymore. And I think like, uh, people in science, at least. And there aren't that many great, like Isaac Newton, I wouldn't do because he's got, is just like impenetrable writing and he wrote like cryptic grams so that people couldn't <laughs> copy it. Yeah, it's like insane to think about, but Darwin's a beautiful writer. Uh, there are people like Maxwell. And so taking these great books that are at, off, um, whatever they call it, they're in the public record. Some of them, if they're in English, then you don't even need the transcript. And then sitting down with some really good physicists and people that care about science or biologists or whoever, so that they can add their parenthetical things. I think that's a good model for my publishing company to keep going with audiobooks. Um, and, you know, and then, so I'll just see, but um, I'm definitely open to it. I've got some ideas for a few different new books coming up. Uh, but I think, I think, well, certainly I've got ideas for the self-publishing audiobook, 
the Think Like a Nobel Prize winner, I would just keep using Lioncrest if, if they're available. Um, and then the, the uh, traditional publisher, I have two main ideas I'm kicking around, but they're so, it's so much work, as you know, to <laughs> sit down and write a book. Uh, and, you know, right now I really, you know, I published, like I said, three books in, in four years. And that's a lot. Uh, I, I would say a good, a good stand, like a pattern for me would be maybe a book every two years in this model. And, um, you know, that way you enjoy it. Cause that, that's the thing I, I don't want to ever have to, like, I have to do it to make money or something. For sure, man. That's awesome. You have Altucher. I remember it's so crazy to think because he was kind of at the beginning of my journey. He, he probably does not know who I am. But when I was like 19, 1920, I'm 30 now. So it was about 10 years ago. I went to a conference called Mastermind Talks. I don't know oh, if yeah. you've heard of it. And uh, yeah, I was actually a, um, why can't I think of that word? Sorry. It's like uh, when you like do something for free uh, for someone, I like oh, uh, intern, intern. Yeah, yeah. I was like an intern. I actually lived up uh, Jason Gaynard for about six months in Canada uh, interning under him. So I went to that first event. I remember when James spoke, it was, I just thought he was incredible. Dude. Oh, there, he you know, Tim Ferriss, there was other amazing speakers too, but James is, um, I mean, I don't even know how to describe. It. I just think he's amazing. Like, he's oh yeah, awesome. he's he's very creative. He's very vulnerable. Yeah. He's very honest. Yeah, I met him at the TED talk that I gave here in San Diego. He was the closing speaker, and and then for years I was like, oh, I got to get on a show, uh, but he wouldn't like answer my emails and stuff because um, he like he's got like three hundred thousand unread emails. So if you've ever sent him an email, don't expect a reply. Um, but then finally, I got in touch with the guy by the name of Jordan Harbinger. And I got in, uh, a couple to him because of a guy who runs a podcast called Man Talk. This, this whole chain of events, this one podcast, which actually got trashed and I had to redo it. And then I got in touch with Jordan and then Jordan couldn't do the podcast for two years and finally did it. Um, and then I, I, I only like to ask each person maybe for one favor. I don't like, you know, people, ask, can you introduce me to Lex Friedman? I'm like, can you introduce me to Joe Rogan? Yeah. I mean, I don't like this transactional kind of stuff. So, so I, but I did tell Jordan, I was like, Jordan, you know, the only thing I want from you is an intro to James. And he actually have been in touch with him because we did his Ted talk, put me in touch. Then I went on James's show and then years, you know, we've done six episodes of his podcast. He's been on my show two or three times. And uh, it's just great. The podcast community, author community is really good. And, uh, you know, I really just hope to continue it. It's fun to go on other people's shows and just talk about yourself, right? We're all narcissists at some level. 100%. No, but it is addicting, like you said, though, too, like, because I've done almost like, I think I'm almost at like 2000 episodes now. Now, the, the first like 1000 were much shorter. Yeah, but regardless. I just find it, I do it mostly to learn, man. I love it. So it's oh, yeah. So now year. after me, can I ask you, who's your dream guest? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, it would probably be Joe or Lex. I mean, because I, Joe, Lex, or Tim Ferriss, I listen to those three the most. Mm -hmm. So it'd probably be, and actually I Instagram, uh, and I'm not asking you for an introduction to be clear, oh, yeah. but I'm just saying this. I did post uh, me watching one of Lex's, I think it was with, I can't remember who it was with. He reposted it. And then I messaged him, asked him to be on. He left me on red. <laughs> so and I was like, you know what? I'll wait. I'll get there at some point. Um, I have his phone number and I, and he leaves those on reds on red sometimes. Too. Yeah, no, but so at least he saw it. So I'll take it. We're getting close. Um, but so I know you have to go soon, but I want to leave the floor to you. Um, uh, anything else you want to share? And then also um, where people can stay in contact and, and all that. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to you know emulate stuff that you're doing on the Instagram. It's 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 hard to. There's no like category for like Twitter or Instagram for like professors and scientists and stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, that that's kind of a little bit of a lacuna in, in their policies that they, you know, I'm a public, you know, I'm a real person and you know whatever I've got, but they they don't make it super easy. So yeah, I mean, I'm trying to you know kind of up my game there just because as you know, it's it's harder to almost publicize that you're doing this great content. Um, versus, you know, versus having people, you know, come on the show and, and do it, which is also a lot of work. So it's really saying, yeah, uh, the, the main way I'm, I'm trying to communicate now is through my mailing list, which is briankeating.com slash list. And, and like I said, you can get a meteorite. So here's what it will look like. If you're one of the first hundred lucky people, 99 lucky people after time. Because me and my brother, <laughs> you and your brother, brother got to get some some space some space schmutz. Um, so this is actually this old fragment of something that hit the Earth 
thousands of years ago, but is actually billions of years old and is made up of the same materials, you know, poetically that flow in our bodies. This is the same mineral. It has iron in it. Iron's in the hemoglobin molecule that flows in our blood that allows us to breathe and metabolize oxygen. So if you join the mailing list, you will get a uh, sample. If you're among the first hundred people and you live in the U S I'm sorry, I haven't been, I, I'm trying to figure I'm going to England in the in next year. I'm going to take some samples over there to give out and giving a talk at a very famous uh, place called the Royal institution, which is in London, which is where, you know, Einstein, not Einstein, well, Einstein did speak there, but it was people like uh, Isaac Newton and others were uh, founding members of. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'll bring some swag for our, your listeners over there. If they're, if they're around, I'll, I'll publicize that. Uh, and yeah, just uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm uh, Dr. Brian Keating. Perfect, man. Thanks again for coming on. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you.